Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Zoom Out by Sprint Agile. Good afternoon if you are in the US. Good evening if you are in the UK. This is a global podcast now, so welcome from wherever you're joining. Today, I have the pleasure of having Pauline Roberts on the show. Welcome, Pauline. Pauline has been a great teacher to me. I attended two of her systems thinking courses. She's a systems thinking lecturer and a systems thinking practitioner who goes into organizations and helps bring in systems thinking in organizations when they're becoming more effective. Welcome, Pauline. How have you been? Thanks, Arash. It's absolutely great to be here. I mean, it was a great pleasure to meet you when you came on the training uh, and I saw a lot of things where we had things, you know, areas in common. Our thinking was very aligned. And so that was really quite motivating to me to, to get to know you and talk to you at that time. So, yeah, it, it's been a great time, been really busy, lots of training, lots of workshops, lots of helping organisations and an awful lot of helping people with uh, system change as well. So there's been a lot going on. Great, great. Love to hear that. You know, the work that you've been doing is great and super helpful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, I certainly took a lot from your courses. Great. Okay, so my first question to you today is you do you have created something called the systems thinking change wheel. Could you tell us a little bit about that and like how do we bring in systems thinking into into change management? Yeah, I have. Uh, the approach that I use is called creating the conditions for change. And when I was going into organizations or when I was working inside of organizations, bringing a systems thinking lens to it, mm-hmm. I realized that I was doing something slightly different to what some of my peers were doing. So they were applying systems thinking approaches in quite a technical manner. And I was focusing on something very slightly different. And at the time, I wasn't really sure what it was. And so I went on this exploration and I realized that I was focusing on what the people were actually doing in the situation at the time. And what I realized was an organization or a group of people working across a geographical place together, you have to nurture the soil for them to grow as much as making a change at the same time. So there was two elements to my work. So I focused on making improvements with people, but I also focused on creating the conditions for change. And as part of that, I I pulled together an infographic that I've called the systems thinking change wheel. And it's based on something called a viable system model, which was something that was designed by somebody called Stafford Beer. He developed it back in the 1950s. And what it is, it's the kind of flip side of a viable system model. So a viable system model might look at how an organization can survive and thrive over time in a changing environment. Um, Sorry, Pauline. Sorry to stop you there. Could you tell us a bit about what's a viable system model? Yeah, a a viable system model is a way that um, you can look at an organization through a particular lens and look to see what it is that makes this organization or any system that it is you're looking at doesn't have to be a full organization. What makes it viable? What makes it survive? What makes it thrive? And what makes it change in line with the environment around it so it can survive over a longer period of time? And that's what that model is is aimed to do. Um, It's focused on what people do when they're managing. So it's focused on how do we manage this organization or this system that we're looking at. But actually, there was a side of that that people weren't talking about. And that was what the people were actually doing and what the people actually need to be effective in their work and when they're making change and making improvements. And so they were the things that I started to pull out. And... In the systems thinking change wheel, it is the human side of the viable system model. So it's not the more technical side. It's the what are people doing in this situation? How are they organizing themselves? How are they coordinating? What is it that's making that effective? When we think about 
performance managing and when we think about allocating resources in organizations and systems the people aren't necessarily interested in following a false performance target it may, it's meaningless to them so what do they do instead that makes it effective and i started to explore that and instead of having really harsh performance targets in there we started to think about well the viable system model tells us to monitor things. So what is it do we monitor? And I started to look at system health rather than a performance mm. target. So we start to look at system health with people. So how is our system performing? Is it healthy? Are we building relationships? Are we working well together? Is it is it effective? Can we change or are we stumbling all over the place all of the time? So there was a whole, that? yeah, sorry, go on, Arish. So I was, I was going to dig a bit deeper on, on that aspect. So am I yeah. right in saying an example of it would be, for example, when you have individuals assigning their performance goals of, let's say, I don't know, I'm going to do such and such by the end of the year, or I'm going to, I don't know, run, yeah. for example, as an agile coach, I could say my performance goal is I will run 10 agile training for the teams within an organization, for example. Mm -hmm. So moving away from that and looking at the outcomes of the organizations, such as ENPS of employees working there as, as an attribute to monitor, is that, is that right? Yes, it, it is about looking for different attributes to monitor. Um, so what mm -hmm. I would be looking for in an organization, I'd be looking for how how different elements in the organization or, or across organizations, how the relationships are working, how the collaboration is working. Um, are any of the structures that are in place, are they helping or hindering? So are they able to bring any kind of new life into what people are doing or is it hindering them? So I'd be looking for those things. Are those things making the environment healthy or are they making it sick? Um, and I'd be looking at how people were behaving. So I'd be looking at, are they collaborating? Are they building relationships with one another? Do they pass information from one another? Do they peer to peer coach one another? Um, do they support one another in the jobs? Because they, to me, are some of the things that make the work work. Mm -hmm. And they are some of the things that we often overlook because we believe that they happen naturally. We believe that they just happen. Yes. And actually, they don't. Uh, we have to work at them. Exactly. And do you have a structure or a system that you would identify these attributes and uh, define how you're going to measure them and then go about measuring them? Or is it more of a subjective, uh, gut feeling, intuitive way, actually? It, it's a little bit of both. Um, so using the viable system model as as a basis for what I do, I kind of flip it round um, and look at the human element of it. So I might look at something and say, well, what is this thing that I'm looking at? And I might look at it through a system lens. And then I'll kind of apply the principles and thinking behind the viable system model to it. But then, for example, I'll give you an example. We use um, Ashby's Law of Requisite Variety. Um, and so, you know, variety can only match variety. What does that really mean? We have to respond to the things that we can deal with. So say if I was an organization and I was thinking about demand, um, I might want to, to amplify my response to demand so that I can deal with it. Or I might want to attenuate the demand that's coming at me so that I can deal with it. And that's something we would do quite technically through the viable through the lens of the viable system model but mm -hmm. actually i focus on the people so what is it we have to attenuate and amplify for the people to be able mm -hmm. to work really effectively um and and fulfill their potential and bring their gifts to the floor and actually what i realized was a lot of people who i was engaging with in these organizations they're burnt out they're very frustrated um, they're a little bit underconfident sometimes. They're, they're worn out. They've had a tough time, particularly lately. And that was sapping their energy. So actually, what was it I wanted to attenuate? Well, I wanted to attenuate their fear. And I wanted to attenuate their anxiety. And I wanted to attenuate any kind of uh, frustration that was hindering them. 
those things are natural having some of those things in a situation is fine but when it goes too far people just get burnt out and they get zapped so i wanted to attenuate those so what conditions did i need to put in place to make sure that those things were reducing and what mm -hmm. is it i need to do with the people to then amplify their confidence their curiosity their their ability to make decisions and make change and those that was the other side of the coin that was the stuff i was focusing on the human side of it all of the time and mm -hmm. <clears throat> sometimes that's the bit like i say that people miss or they don't talk about or that they don't think has to have any kind of focus and i actually it, why i came to do that was i went back over 10 years worth of my own work and questioned myself and said what are you doing when that worked what were the other people in the situation doing what was it that made them feel like they could do that change and actually it wasn't the technical elements that were doing it it was when people were confident when they felt trusted when there was empathy when there was humanity um it was when they'd built up really good relationships and actually that was a massive revelation to me a number of years back and it wasn't what i expected to find um mm -hmm. and so it caused a lot of uh, confusion in my own mind about how do i do this work then this is crazy these are yeah. just human things why are we missing these things out and that's why i started to focus on them on and made them almost like the other side of the coin to the fireable system model so i could put the two things together an almost mm -hmm. technical um feeling systems thinking approach but with the human element linked to it on the other side and that was where i was going going with that mm. so it's really good it's interesting you mentioned that because recently i read something a quote from i can't remember who something on the lines of if you focus on performance people are going to burn out but if you focus on people performance is going to go up right absolutely and i i had witnessed this myself many many years ago i once worked um in the nhs in the uk and i worked on um uh, hospital discharge and there's a massive focus on we have to keep these de um delays down in hospital discharge and everybody every week just used to think about how many numbers are on that list and how can we get them down and i thought this is absolutely crazy throw that list away i don't want to see it and i don't want to hear about it what are we going to focus on what i focused on was building relationships with teams getting them to talk to one another making a, a process where they could interact with each other having the time to do it making some meaning of what they were doing together and I focused completely and utterly on the relationships and the communication between them and making them feel like they were peer supporting one another and making them feel like they wanted to be curious about what was going on in this situation. The next thing I knew, we'd kept delayed discharge figures below national and regional average for three years. We'd never even looked at them. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, if you look after the people, I think it's right. The performance comes. So what that example you brought up um, is um, the, the, it's about a topic that I've been recently thinking about quite a lot, which may be a, a little bit of a controversial topic. Mm -hmm. And what's the role of management? Uh, you see, this is especially more important or more visible in healthcare, mm -hmm. in non-for-profits and governments, that what manager feels, what management thinks and feels they have to do is they have to ensure performance is high. So they come up with numbers, they want to manage things. But I would say, if I would hypothesize, if they just move away, if they just stop doing what they're doing and trust people, these are doctors, highly trained professionals, or if you know, if you go to community uh, uh, services or non-for-profit, you're dealing with psychologists or say lawyers, these are highly trained, highly intelligent people. You just trust them to do the right thing. And your role as a leader would be relationship builder. You have that bird's eye view. You know, like those people have to talk with each other, go talk, you know, create that condition for relationship. It's a different world, right? What do you think about that? 
absolutely i'm 100 percent with you i think the manager is there to create the to enable the create the creation of the conditions so that people can do the work that they need to do mm -hmm. um certainly i know when i've been in a position when i felt hugely empowered to make change has been when a director above me has said this is what I'm not allowed to do. I, you know, me as your director, I can't go past that or I can't go past that. Anything within that, do what you like to, to make sure we do what we need to do. I don't care what it is or how you do it, but we can't go past these two lines. And this mm -hmm. is the way I like my decisions to be made. Make sure you consider these one, two, three, four, five things. Anything outside of that, go. Now, I was given that freedom in the early stages of when I was developing this kind of work and I realized what that did for me it gave me free range to do anything and I got really really good results and I find now that if you take you know let go of the reins don't rein people in so long as you know they know how you like decisions to be made the things that need to be considered and they know where the boundaries are that they can't go beyond for various reasons then let them go they all come with huge gifts. They know what they're doing. They're intelligent people. They can just get on with it and they will find a way to do it better than you could ever imagine. Uh, every time they find the best way. And there's something in there that you said about trust. You absolutely have to build up that trustful relationship. If you don't trust them, how can that relationship even work? That's not a good condition for change if there's distrust in a situation so how do you build that trust up with each other it's absolutely, absolutely. vital so pauline why why do you think that's the case why do you think most managers especially in healthcare nonprofit and governments i've observed this quite a lot mm. they get in the way of professionals rather than making it easier so what why do you think is you know the driver of these behaviors i think sometimes it's pressure um you know they get great pressure from above and they get told to perform really quickly and they've already got performance management um things in place for themselves so they're being judged and they there are only certain things that the people above them will listen to so for example have you ever heard a chief executive say oh yes you've collaborated with all of these people today fantastic let's give you a promotion they won't. They'll say, did you hit your performance targets today? Off you go to the top of the organization. So we've got to focus on incorrect things. And that's a historical focus. So I think there's something about pressure. I think there's something about historical practices. And there's something about, do we even give them the space to try something differently? And do we allow those managers who are in those places to be vulnerable and say, do you know what? I don't know how to do it another way. And there's something about allowing them vulnerability as well. We often focus on the people on the ground. But what about the managers? Because they're in quite a tough position. There is a role for a manager in there, I think. Um, there's always a role. They need to set the parameters. They need to say these are the boundaries you can't go beyond. But they also need to create the right conditions for people to be able to use their gifts to the full. And so I think our focus is incorrect. And part of like that, like I say, is historical. Part of it is because of the structures with it that they are absolutely rooted in. And part of it is, you know, they've got someone sitting above them, <laughs> stamping down on their heads, and there's not much else they can do about that, but, but give them what they need to hear. And so we've got a lot of perverse things going on that are, are creating that. Absolutely. And, you know, if you, take, if you talk about government, uh, non-for-profit and those kind of organizations, it goes all the way up to the politicians, right? It goes all the way up to parliament. Absolutely. So you could get to some very dysfunctional places at the top. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it does cascade down. I know certainly before I became a business consultant, I worked um, in a commission, as a commissioning manager in the NHS. And we would get demands from, you know, the next level up from us and demands would be coming from ministers and that would cascade down really, really quickly, usually on a Friday afternoon and they'd want information within an hour. And so everybody had to stop what they were doing and make sure that that information cascaded back up. And actually mm. they had us on a hamster wheel and we just kept going on the hamster wheel because 
the more we couldn't give them what they wanted, the more they demanded it. And so the harder the effort to give them what they wanted, which wasn't what they really needed. And so it was just more and more and more effort into the hamster wheel rather than stopping and saying, hang on a minute, that isn't what you need to hear about. This is what you need to hear about. But we, we sometimes, you know, we just don't slow down. We don't slow down and think about it. We're that busy, what we used to call it, feeding the beast. We're that busy feeding the beast that we yes. don't think, how do we do this differently? Exactly. Um, so there's something in there about giving the time and the space to sit back and think. Absolutely. Tame the beast rather than feeding Tame it. Tame the beast. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were, yeah, exactly. That's what we should have been doing, taming the beast or locking exactly. it in the cage and <laughs> yeah. throwing away the key. But, you exactly. know, we're stuck in these structures and these dynamics and ways of being. Um, but what I am seeing, certainly in the work that I'm doing, um, I've had a lot of demand lately from work um, on people from people on the ground in communities or charitable organisations working together who are working towards system change. That's their aim. They want system change. And I'm seeing people who have, um, they're not in high level positions in organisations. They've never come across systems thinking before. We give them a few skills and a, and a few tools and a few ideas to play with. And then ask, invite them to bring out their gifts. What gifts do you have? And their creati creativity and the way they think is absolutely amazing. And I'm seeing some incredible work starting to rumble underneath the surface um, mm -hmm. from these people who are creating the right conditions. They're nurturing one another. They're peer-to-peer -peer supporting one another. They're building the relationships first before they're doing mm -hmm. anything else. They are building an atmosphere of um, complementing one another and collaborating with one another and sharing with one another. And they're working to get that element right first. And what I'm seeing come out of that, emerge out of that, is some amazing work at, um, mm -hmm. at a ground community level. And I'm, you know, I've always been a little bit of a doubter. Can we deal with these big structures in government, these big structures in public services but actually there's there's a little movement coming particularly in the UK from below that might just shock shock people a little bit further down the line um, as it starts to gain momentum great great absolutely now I have two really interesting comments uh coming up coming in live which I'd like to read for you they're really interesting mm. uh first one is I think common fault of management is forgetting their facilitators or should be really and the second one is I found in a non-for-profit, those leaders were not capable of letting their teams to lead. They use the power within their positions yeah. to strike fear, command and control, and really enable growth within their other leaders. Director level down tried to practice change management, but did not have the support of leadership. Absolutely. Yeah. Both are There's the a real perverse incentive, isn't there, in power and control? And I come across this frequently in every bit of work that I do and there becomes a point where power and control starts to sneak in and I think um, a lot of the time people who I work with are more comfortable when they have control over a situation and they feel powerful so mm -hmm. how do we then allow them to step out of that and step into vulnerability and be supported to do so because at the minute we don't, do we? we? We very often, we put them in the position where power and control is all they can do because sometimes they're looked upon to be the people who know everything rather than the ones who can say, hands up, I feel really vulnerable, I don't know what to do here. My team probably have the answers. How do I create the right conditions for them to just get on with it? I think that's on the spot. That's that's absolutely a, a, a leverage point in changing the system. I absolutely agree moving how do you help leaders move away from power and control into vulnerability and trust love it now before yeah. we finish Pauline, um there was something one of my biggest insightful moments in one of your course courses where um when you talked about water and fish you remember that oh yes i do yes i've been talking <laughs> yeah, about that, that today <laughs> Yeah, it's a little exercise that we do with everyone. Um, 
and it's not my exercise it's from somebody else's book um matthew syed i think you call him um mm -hmm. and it's a, it's just a picture of an aquarium or a fish tank or and we ask people what is it you see what is it you see in front of you and it's such a powerful exercise every group of people um that i've done this with the first thing is they'll say oh we see fish or we see coral um or we see um some seaweed very very rarely do they say oh well we can see the water and and the point is we stop seeing context it's around us all the time um it's the very thing that gives things life and yet it becomes invisible and in systems the things that we do to bring empathy and humanity into situations i find is largely invisible and so a lot of my work, I, I focus on making it visible and making sure that is the focus and making sure that it is highlighted and people are seeing it and are understanding it because that's the kind of context that starts to build the right conditions for change. And it's the conditions that will it will give life. Um, and and it, it seems so obvious when you when you stand and talk about it like this now, but actually when you're in that system, you can't see it. You're so busy trying to keep the hamster wheel going that you just stop seeing that context. And it's a beautiful little exercise. Like I say, it's not mine. It's it's absolutely excellent. But I use it with a lot of groups and, and it's a real eye opening moment for a lot of people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, uh, uh, an alternative version of that uh, that I've heard is two young fish are swimming by and there's this older fish swimming by the older fish says hey guys how's the water today and the two young fish said what what is water <laughs> right <laughs> so my question that's a question i ask you pauline as well now i'm asking it from the audience i'm challenging the audience basically what is your water go and figure out what is your water okay. that you don't see you're swimming in it every day you're in the aquarium, but you don't see it, which is the most important thing, actually. Okay, thank you so much. Any final thoughts, Pauline? Um, it, it, final thought is think of the obvious. Think of the obvious that you might have forgotten about. And that's what I always say to people. What's the obvious stuff here that you think happens automatically? Because actually it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. And it's those things that can really create some powerful change absolutely thank you so much pauline it was such a pleasure to having you here on the show i really look forward to attending more of your courses in future or who knows if i come to uk or you come down here we could catch up for a coffee mm -hmm. lovely thanks arash it's been great yeah it's been great getting to know you and the discussions we have are, are always really good and really insightful so yeah it's lovely to to liaise with you and talk to you tonight so thanks very much thank you so much and thanks everyone for watching Please don't forget to go to the YouTube channel and subscribe because that's the best place to see these live videos.